Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. You've had a long week so get comfortable and grab a drink because this first impressions video is going to be a long one. Before that though, as per usual, a scheduling update. Seeing as how next weekend is Father's Day as of this recording, I won't be uploading or streaming to Twitch. I'm going to take that time to spend with my wife, daughter, and my own father. So to make up for that, I'm going to run a longer video than my first two. Then we'll resume normal scheduling with Persona 4 following up. Scheduling update out of the way, let's get some headway on this video. Like I said, it's lengthy. As the video title suggests, this is a first impression video on Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne. I'll be using footage from the remaster because of personal preference, but both games look great. So the story starts off with you and your friends making your way to Shinjuku Medical Center to meet up with your teacher, Miss Yuko Takao, for your friend Chiaki to discuss her career paper. Your other friend Isamu is tagging along to try and woo Miss Takao into a presumably sexual relationship, because he's a bit of a shitlord. On your way up there, you stop at your Yogi Park, because that's the original meeting place and you're late, as per usual, where you run into a journalist named Hijiri who hands you a magazine he produces called Ayakashi Monthly. He then explains that he theorizes that the massacre that took place in Yoyogi Park was actually a full-blown gang war between two different cults. When your character arrives at Shinjuku Medical Center, your friend Chiaki chastises you for being late. She then takes your issue of Ayakashi Monthly and further chastises you for taking a magazine from a strange dude and for bringing an occult magazine to Shinjuku Medical Center. This happens regardless of whatever choice you pick. She then sends you to find your shitlord friend Isamu. Going through the hospital, one thing should be very apparent. There's not a single soul in Shinjuku Medical Center. Not a patient, doctor, visitor, nor any signs of Yuko Takao. Finally, you creep up on Isamu slumming it in an empty patient's room. He pitches a bitch about you scaring him, then accompanies you down to the first floor. On the first floor, you, Chiaki, and Isamu discuss the main article in Ayakashi Monthly which reiterates the idea that it was a cult war disguised as a protest of a new cell tower supposed to be constructed in Yoyogi Park by Cyber's Communication, owned by a Mr. Hikawa that we'll, we'll meet later. It is then suggested that your character check the basement floor by Isamu who relinquishes the basement key card. Suggested is kind of a loose term. Isamu is a bit of a chicken shit so he voluntold you to go down there and check anyway. Getting down into the basement, things get really strange. In one room, there's the remnants of a cult ritual, including a massive sigil on the floor and inverse pentagrams on posts on either side of the door. In another room, papers are strewn about on the floor and desks are haphazardly placed like somebody left in the hurry. In the last room you can enter, Hikawa, CEO of Cyber's Communication, sits in front of a large barrel-shaped object in the center of the room, perplexed at who could have disturbed his peaceful stillness then summons a Baphomet to give you the death sentence. If you choose to stand and face him, you're a fool. If you decide you're gonna run away, you're a coward. There's no winning with Hikawa. Just as the demon is about to show you what a popsicle in hell looks like, none other than the elusive Yuko Takao steps in to save you. After abusing Hikawa's ego a bit, she tells you to go meet her at the roof. On your way to the roof, an old woman followed by a young blonde kid blink into existence, exchanging some shady foreshadowing before subsequently poofing to the nether. Like this never happened, you hit the elevator and go to the roof. It's there we witness one of the most beautiful PS2 cutscenes I've ever seen, The Conception. Black lightning strikes the grounds of Tokyo and the city starts curling in on itself, revealing the vortex world you'll traverse later. As the conception ends, you're transported to the newly formed Kagetsuchi. He despairs at you for not being born into the world with a reason, which is a rule that shapes the birth of the new world and sends you off into the ruins of Tokyo to go find your reason. As you're being transported to the ruins of Tokyo, you're intercepted by the old woman from earlier who holds you down, while the young blonde kid drops a weird fucking bug into your face which I can only assume is the Magatama Marugera. I'll apologize for the pronunciation of that Magatama. I'm not exactly sure how it's pronounced. 
You wake up in the basement of Shinjuku Hospital completely covered it head to toe in tattoos with a massive horn sticking out the back of your neck. On investigation, you find Hijiri, the sketchy reporter guy, in the room next to the barrel Hikawa was in. He remarks upon your appearance and tells you what you already know. The conception happens. He makes the exchange of intel for intel and you're on your way. Before you can make your way through the rest of Shinjuku Medical Center, a young woman and an old blonde guy intercept you and drop you into what I can only describe as the small intestine. You're led by the nose to a stage where he drops yet more foreshadowing bullshit on you before spitting you out in Shinjuku Medical Center. Let me tell you, it's completely fucked. There's a pile of trash and dirt in front of one entrance and the other is guarded by a really tough looking demon. You meet your first demon pixie here as well. After recruiting a few more demons and defeating Forneus, the tough demon that you see at the beginning, you finally get your first view of Ruin Tokyo, also known as the Vortex World. Every human who was once living here is now a spirit, doomed to be devoured for its makatsuhi, or life essence. Your next stop is Yoyogi Park to fulfill a deal with Pixie. I kept Pixie around because I had already invested a bunch of levels into her, and I heard you get a good late game character later on anyway, so... I mean, you can't beat it. Afterward, you move on to Shibuya to find Chiaki. There's a bit you can do down here in Shibuya. Outside of the cutscene with Chiaki, you can deal with the tutorial of demon summoning, there's a junk shop where you can buy some Magatama, among other useful items here and a few other demons to talk to, one of which mentions having a meeting with Forneus, who is freshly dead. After having your shortcut scene with Chiaki in the nightclub, you move your way to the bullshit that is the Amala Network. This place is the Mega 10 version of the Lost Woods, but the only hints you have are your map. The map, which only fills up as you move, you don't actually get a full auto map. So, I mean, good luck. You'll be taking quite a few wrong turns unless you find yourself a walkthrough. After you complete this area, you're fed into the small intestine once again, this time noted as the Labyrinth of Amala, where the old blonde guy, now known as Lucifer, gives you something called a menorah. In the original, this was called a candelabra, so I'll refer to it as that from here on out because once again, personal preference. It sounds cool. It spits you out into Ginza which is where you start investigating the assembly of Nilo, followers of which believe in Ikawa's reason of Shijima, which you find about later on. After investigation, you're sent on your way to the great underpass of Ginza, which is on the way to Ikabukuro, where you're supposed to meet Gozu Tenno, the leader of the Mantra Demons, yet another faction in the race to rebuild the world. It's here where you meet mannequins for the first time. Walking Magatsuchi reserves in the shape of humans that either end up in hiding or mantra slaves. Very fearful of your presence at first, but eventually move you through on the premise that you'll leave them alone after passing. Before moving any further though, you're stopped by the game's answer to grind your character and swing, Matador. It's here that I'll end the story portion and move on to my opinions. Gameplay in this game is a bare bones version of what you would see a lot later on in the Megami Tensei franchise. Combat is turn based with both the players choosing their attacks and executing, the enemy doing the same. However the game rewards you, no practically begs you to exploit the enemy's weakness and shoots for you to use status buffs and debuffs. Whenever you exploit a weakness you get something called a press turn which is an extra half turn to complete an action. The aforementioned Matador is the wake-up call most people needed to use debuffs because he has a skill that raises his accuracy and evasion to its maximum. For me this was a welcome change from the classic fight a boss, lose, grind, and whoop his ass formula implemented in almost every other turn-based game I've played. The game also features a mechanic called Demon Negotiation where mid-battle you can talk to a demon to try to recruit it to your side by giving it money, items, or a combination of both. If the demon ends up indecisive, it will also ask a philosophical question, your answer being the make or break, the decision of whether you're getting a new teammate or not. My biggest loss when it comes to this is always Apsaras. I pick one, 
when the opposite would net me her companionship. Demons in your party can evolve as well and even give you items on occasion. There's also a function that can affect negotiation called the Kagetsuchi phase, which changes as you walk. It cycles as the moon does, displaying new Kagetsuchi up to full Kagetsuchi, but the cycle completes, I want to say, almost every 20 minutes. So earlier I mentioned a mechanic called Demon Fusion. You stop at the Cathedral of Shadows to do so. There are two types of Demon Fusion in this game. Your standard 2 Demon Fusion and Sacrificial Fusion. Sacrificial Fusion can only occur on a full Kagetsuchi phase, and you get to chip in a third demon for a stronger than normal demon. Or even a demon you didn't expect or didn't want. I haven't experimented with this yet, so I can't really tell you if the random character makes or breaks you in the end. Mechanics I've experienced out of the way, let's move on to art. Kazuma Kanako reprises his role as artist for Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne, and I gotta say, he outdid himself on this game. The environments and cutscenes are absolutely gorgeous. His character stylization makes for very memorable characters, especially in Isamu and Demifiend, Demifiend being accentuated by his full body tattoo. Environments invoke questions about the powers that be and keep me, personally, investing more time into the game just to see more of the environment. The Amala network, though I hate it, is still very interesting with all the Magatsuchi flowing through the ground in the ceiling. And the labyrinth of Amala is just so uncomfortable and weird that I can only describe it as the small intestine. And certain spots will even invoke some tryptophobia in some of you. Ruin Tokyo gives you an absolute feeling of desolation as you move your small cursor around traveling from place to place on the map. It truly feels like you're the only one alive, and this feeling is exacerbated by the random black cracks of abyss that litters the vortex world, blocking any form of direct travel. The demons themselves are among the most creatively designed characters out of any game I've ever seen, and I haven't even experienced the half of them yet. My two favorites are Lilum and Chronozon, because what in the fuck is that amalgamation of faces? Unfortunately, because I haven't experienced a lot of the demons in this game yet, seeing as I've only played maybe four hours, five hours of it, something like that, I can only give you a very, very, very brief statement on what I like about them. There's still more to play in this game, so I'm going to wrap up here. My first impression of this game is simple. This game is an absolute masterpiece, from the art to the story to the gameplay. I haven't even touched on the music, but I'll do that in a later video, because once again I haven't nearly experienced enough of the game to really formulate an opinion on it. The only minor gripes I have are going from the original PS2 port to the HD remaster, like the two bouts of paid DLC, that being the Maniacs Edition and the extra dungeons that give you experience and money. I know I don't have to buy them, I don't have to use them, but still, it's a little irritating. If you made it to the end of this video, this one was a long one. Thank you. I'm glad I was able to stutter my way through about 15 minutes of a video for you guys to entertain yourself with. I had a blast making this and playing the game. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like and your subscription. It helps a lot. If you didn't, give me the painful thumbs down. I will have earned it at that point. Please also consider leaving a like on my Twitter and Facebook page as well. I'll post more there as time progresses. And if I get 100 subs here and on Twitch, I'll make a Discord server as well. That's all for this video. I'll see you guys after Father's Day.